Welcome to Prague again. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Anne was with us in the year 2000. Time goes rather fast, being in time. So what would you like to say? <laughs> You've been here for two days. <laughs> What's on your mind? It's a fantastic festival. It's a beautifully curated festival, I think. You have brought together writers, uh, every kind of writer, every sort of human being, and um, come to see what we say to each other. I think it's a wonderful thing. You have been speaking today about memory and the sense of public memory. Maybe you could speak to, to us about your concept of public memory and the importance of public rather than personal memory. We were talking earlier today about The Winter Vault, this new novel. And um, this novel looks at three historic events. The first is the building of the uh, Aswan Dam in Egypt in the 1960s and the flooding of Nubia. Many, many people uh, dispossessed of their homes. And also uh, the flooding of many, many hundreds of archaeological sites. And uh, one of those uh, temples, uh, archaeological sites, was the Temple of Abu Simbel. And uh, there was a great campaign by UNESCO to save this temple from the floodwaters. Uh, and many uh, ideas put forward uh, on how the temple should be saved. Uh, should it be floated, floated up uh, above the floodwaters? Should, should we encase it in glass? There are many, many schemes put forward. Um, but in the end, they decided simply to cut the temple into pieces and re-erect it 60 meters higher. The second historic event was the construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway in Canada, which also dispossessed many hundreds, thousands of people, um, flooded towns and villages. And as in Nubia, in Egypt, um, flooded graves, many graves and cemeteries. And the um, hydro company, the electric company uh, building the dam asked these people, um, you know, they said, uh, we can move the graves, we'll pay for it, as if it were something very simple. And the people there said, um, we will leave the graves where they are, but for many, many, many years afterwards, uh, people were afraid to swim in the river for fear that the dead would rise up into the water. The third historic event is the rebuilding of Warsaw. And as you know, this is a very uh, particular uh, situation because, first of all, the city was not destroyed by mass bombing. It was just dismantled building by building in a very systematic way. And after the war, the decision was made, a very poignant decision, not simply to rebuild, but to replicate, create an exact copy of the old town, every lamppost, every windowsill, every cornice, every, every uh, stoop. And uh, this, uh, this was a very understandable uh, feeling to bring back the past in this way. But in, we, we can't bring back the past. We can't bring back the dead. And so what is left is a, is a memorial, uh, this replica, uh, which, is, which is quite disturbing. And uh, in a way, uh, our way of remembering, this way of remembering is, is, is also a way of forgetting. Uh, and so when I began writing this book, I was thinking very much about ways in which we remember historic events, not personally, but 
in a public way, in a public forum. Uh, for example, Warsaw chooses to replicate uh, in, in Coventry, in, in England, they, they leave the ruins where they are and build a, a, a vast, very modern uh, cathedral right next to the ruins. That's their way of making a public memory. Uh, and and in, in each case, uh, the community, the need of the community dictates how an event will be remembered in, in a public way. And uh, this book, which I think at its very core is an argument of hope, for hope, um, is, is concerned with, with dispossession, uh, what it means to be dispossessed, what we have left, what remains when one is dispossessed of home, landscape, in the case of the Nubians, even their calendar, even the way they told time was taken from them. Uh, what remains, what remains I think is, of course our memories, private memory, um, our body, one's own body, and language. Language is something sometimes almost the only thing that remains. And language is another public uh, way of remembering. So, so this book is, is concerned very much with um, how we rebuild the way, our choices, uh, the ways in which we decide to remember in a public, public way. Well, sometimes I feel like a replica. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Singer said, life is a dance on graves. And Zbigniew Herbert, the great Polish poet, said, coming from the Second World War, from Warsaw in ruins, he said, the dead are gentle to us. It leaves us with life, this tension between life and death. And the past, of course, we must incorporate into the living. It's really about living. Uh, how would you sort of take this further in terms of living and, and the word and your work? Very much uh, this novel and the previous novel. Um, I wrote them even, I wrote them to learn to live better. Um, and this uh, examination of questions that have no answers, of uh, inexpressible things about which one must be as precise as possible, because it is those inexpressible things that require the most precision. Um, these are ways in which we um, try to uh, form a relationship to, to history. Um, I think that, that the relationship, uh, that we all have a relationship to history, whether we are overtly uh, conscious of it or not, overtly um, discussing it, uh, nevertheless, we, each of us has a relationship to history, and it is a personal relationship. Edmond Jabez, uh, the extraordinary French poet, born in Cairo, coming to France, meeting Marc Jacob, going back to Cairo, the Suez War, being in France, coming to Paris, writing, writing the, in the book of questions. So we heard about the 20 questions sort of asked of heaven. Uh, th those are not, they're not enough questions. Well, the 200 questions asked of heaven. But the leaf motif of the festival is the, in the beginning, the wound is invisible. We have a world which is visible, especially a commercial world, which is, insists, insists that the world is visible. But yet, a great extent of the world is invisible. So how would you sort of incorporate, and how would you relate, and how have you coped with the idea, in the beginning, the wound is invisible? invisible? I think that in this book, 
there are many characters who speak and there are many different points of view uh, set forward and many stories that are told. And perhaps it's in this web or net of stories and voices that we capture some of that invisibility. Um, there are um, moments uh, in the book when um, I've, I wrote with uh, incredible restraint, almost a painful restraint, um, because sometimes uh, that's the only way to reveal um, something that is very hard to put your, put your finger on. Um, at the core of this story is also the story of a marriage. And um, we all know that marriage is uh, an unutterably private thing and that only those two people really understand what that marriage is. And so um, I wished to convey um, the notion of that privacy between those two people. And a writer, a narrator, um, you know, uh, you have a chance to, to tell everything. But I think it's very important uh, to tell everything, but not always through words. And uh, only through the, the placement of words or placement of an image, placement of a gesture. Um, and so very much uh, this example of privacy between those two characters was something that, that I was building into the way the story is told and my restraint in telling the story. Uh, Edmund Jambez also talked of the sacredness of the word, the sacredness of the book, that one lives within the book, in yourself, in a form of dispossession, a certain floating in really the world, coming back into the book. Are you living in the book? more fully than the world, or is there a balance? Can there be a balance? Are you inside the book? What is the book for yourself, an identity? Well, I think a book is, um, as I said in our last discussion, I think a book is a place to talk about th things that are a safe place to talk about things that are not safe. Um, I think it provides, creates a place in the world where certain discussions can be had, where certain um, things can be uh, understood. It, it creates a place for this. Uh, I think always that, um, you know, there's, there's a moral or an ethical um, function to the language. Um, and, uh, and that morality is, is a kind of muscle that must be exercised. It won't just be, uh, we won't just necessarily do the right thing uh, when our hand is reached for, um, unless, unless we practice morality. And I think, in a way, uh, a book is, is, is a place where one can, can look at complicated, um, messy, difficult moral questions, and, and that is a way of practicing that morality. Jabignev Herbert, who I adore, uh, said in a poem when he returned to Poland, and he had a tremendous library of Loeb classics, which means the translations into English of Greek literature, philosophy, Latin literature, philosophy. Of course, English was his fifth language. In Pan Cogito, the return of Pan Cogito, he's coming back to Warsaw. He says, the complex questions demand a simple answer. So, I call upon you to really read from your wonderful new novel, 
the winter vault. I'm going to read um, two paragraphs which form the very, very brief preface to the book. And then I'm going to read just a, just a couple of pages, a few pages from the beginning uh, to give you a sense, of, a sense of it. Perhaps we painted on our own skin with ochre and charcoal long before we painted on stone. In any case, 40,000 years ago, we left painted handprints on the cave walls of Lascaux, Ardennes, Chauvet. The black pigment used to paint the animals at Lascaux was made of manganese dioxide and ground quartz, and almost half the mixture was calcium phosphate. Calcium phosphate is produced by heating bone 400 degrees Celsius, then grinding it. We made our paints from the bones of the animals we painted. No image forgets this origin. The future casts its shadow on the past. In this way, first gestures contain everything. They are a kind of map. The first days of military occupation, the conception of a child, seeds and soil. Grief is desire in its purest distillation. With the first grave, the first time a name was sown in the earth, the invention of memory. No word forgets this origin. Generators floodlit the temple, a scene of ghastly devastation. Bodies lay exposed, limbs strewn at hideous angles. Each king was decapitated, each privileged neck sliced by diamond-edged hand saws, their proud torsos dismembered by chainsaws, line drilling, and wire cutting. The wide stone foreheads were reinforced by <clears throat> steel bars and a mortar of epoxy resin. Avery watched men vanish in the fold of a regal ear, lose a shoe in a royal nostril, fall asleep in the shade of an imperial pout. The laborers worked for eight hours, dividing the day into three shifts. At night, Avery sat on the deck of the houseboat and recalculated the increasing tension in the remaining rock, reevaluated the wisdom of each cut, the zones of weakness and new stress forces as ton by ton, the temple disappeared. Even in his bed on the river, he saw the severed heads, the limbless minions stacked and neatly numbered in the floodlights awaiting transport. 1,042 sandstone blocks, the smallest weighing 20 tons. The miraculous stone ceiling where birds flew among the stars lay dismantled out in the open, below real stars, the real blackness beyond the floodlights so intense it seemed to be coming apart like wet paper. The workers had first attacked the surrounding rock, a 100,000 cubic meters, carefully plotted, labeled, and removed by pneumatics, and soon the building of artificial hills. To free himself from the noise of the machinery, Avery listened for the river flowing past their bed, his head against the hull. He imagined, clinging to the dark wind, the steady breath of glass blowers in the city 500 kilometers north, the calls of water sellers and soft drink vendors, the shrieking of kingfishers through the surf of ancient palms, each sound evaporating into the desert air where it was never quite erased. The Nile had already been strangled at Saad el Ali, and its magnificent flow had been rerouted before that to increase the output of Delta cotton, to boost the productivity of the unimaginably distant Lancashire mills. 
Avery knew that a river that has been barraged is not the same river, not the same shore, nor even the same water. And although the angle of sunrise into the great temple would be the same, and the same sun would enter the sanctuary at dawn, Avery knew that once the last temple stone had been cut and hoisted 60 meters higher, each block replaced, each seam filled with sand so there was not a grain of space between the blocks to reveal where they'd been sliced, each kingly visage slotted into place, that the perfection of the illusion, the perfection itself, would be the betrayal. If one could be fooled into believing he stood in the original site, by then subsumed by the waters of the dam, then everything about the temple would have become a deceit. And when at last, after four and a half years of overwork, of illness caused by extremities of heat and cold, or by the constant dread of miscalculation, when he stood at last with the ministers of culture, the 50 ambassadors, his fellow engineers, and 1,700 laborers to gape at their achievement, he feared he might break down not with triumph or exhaustion, but with shame. Only his wife understood that somehow holiness was escaping under their drills, was being pumped away in the continuous draining of groundwater, would soon be crushed under the huge cement domes, that by the time Abu Simbel was finally re-erected, it would no longer be a temple. The river moved, slow and alive through the sand, a blue vein along a pallid forearm, flowing from wrist to elbow. Avery's desk was on deck. When he worked late, Jean woke and came to him. He stood up, and she didn't let go, hanging from her own embrace. Calculate me, she said. At dusk, the light was a fine powder, a gold dust settling on the surface of the Nile. As Avery took out his paints from the wooden box, thick cakes of solid watercolor, his wife lay down on the still warm deck. Ceremoniously, he parted her cotton shirt from her shoulders, each time witnessing her body's color deepening, sandstone, terracotta, ochre a glimpse of the secret white stripes under straps, the pale ovals like dampness under stones, untouched by the sun. The secret paleness he would later touch in the dark. Then Jean peeled her sleeves from her arms and turned on her side, her back to him in the velvet light, the light of darkness, more evening than day. Avery leaned overboard, dipped his teacup into the river, then set the circle of water next to him. He chose a color and let it seep into the soft hair of the brush infused with river water. Gently, he released its fullness across Jean's strong back. Sometimes he painted the scene before them, the river bank, the ruinous work that never stopped, the growing pile of stone physiognomy. Sometimes he painted from memory the children hills, until he could smell his mother's lavender soap in the fading heat. He painted, beginning from childhood, until he was again man-grown. Then, almost the moment he finished, he dipped the cup again into the river, and with clear water, drew his wet brush through the fields, through the trees, until the scene dissolved, a wash on her skin. Some of the paint remained in her pores until she bathed, the Egyptian river receiving the last earth of Buckinghamshire in its erasing embrace. Of course, Jean never saw his landscapes, and blind was free to imagine any scene she wished. He would come to think of his wife's languor during that dusk hour, each dusk those months of 1964, as a kind of wedding gift to him. And in turn, she felt herself open under the brush as if he were tracing a current under her skin. In this dusk hour, each gave to the other a secret landscape. In each, a new privacy opened. 
Every evening that first year of their marriage, Avery contemplated Buckinghamshire, his mother's smell, the distance of time from the wet beech forest to this desert, stress points, fissures in elasticity, the pressure map of the soon-to-be-constructed concrete domes, and the heavy, mortal beauty of his wife, whose body he was only beginning to know. He thought about the pharaoh Ramses, whose body above his knees had recently vanished and now lay scattered in the sand, stored in a separate area from the limbs of his wife and daughters. It would be many months before they would be reunited, a family that had not been separated for more than 3,200 years. He thought that only love teaches a man his death, that it is in the solitude of love that we learn to drown. When Avery lay next to his wife, waiting for sleep, listening to the river, it was as if the whole long Nile was their bed. Each night he floated down from Alexandria through the delta of date palms, past isolated Dahabia with their loose sails beached on the banks. Each night before sleep, to dispel the day's equations and graphs, he made this journey in his mind. Sometimes, if Jean was awake, he spoke the journey aloud until he felt her drift into that state of near sleep when one still believes one is awake, hearing nothing. But Avery would continue to whisper to her nonetheless, elaborating the journey with a hundred details in gratitude for the weight of her thigh across his. The river, he felt, heard every word, wove every sigh into itself, until it was filled with dreaming, swelled with the last breath of kings, with the hard breathing of laborers from 3,000 years ago to that very moment. He spoke to the river, and he listened to the river, his hand on his wife in the place their child would someday open her, where his mouth had already so often spoken her, as if he could take the child's name into his mouth from her body. Rebecca, Cleopatra, Sarah, and all the desert women who knew the value of water. <laughs> <laughs>